in a kingdom covered by miasma at the end of the earth, home to monsters that once dominated and devoured mankind. A young girl is taken to the land, where she is presented to the king as the 99th sacrifice. The chancellor, Anubis, thinks that the girl is the scrawniest sacrifice they've been sent, saying she is not worth devouring, and suggests just tearing her apart. But the girl interrupts him, calling him a dog, and claiming that she is worth eating. The two begin to argue, but the king finds her intriguing, and orders Anubis to leave. He is left in the room with the girl, who calls him a short-tempered king, warning him that he'll be alone someday with that attitude. Her watchers, Sai and Klops, tell her to apologize to the king, who makes his way to her as he calls her impudent. The king reveals that every sacrifice before her has trembled in fear when presented to him, so he doesn't believe that the girl is not afraid of him, ordering her to beg for her life, as he wraps his hand around her head. But she just pokes at his paw pads, finding them soft and squishy. The girl claims that she doesn't have a family or a home, so she doesn't mind getting eaten. This sparks the king's interest, asking for her name, and she introduces herself as Sari. The king informs her that the sacrificial ritual will be held on the next night of revelation when the miasma clears, and he plans to keep Sari by his side until then, to see how long her bravado will last. After that, the monsters are surprised to see that Sari is walking around the palace. The officials become upset, asking Anubis if the king plans to keep a human pet in the palace, as they remind him that the late king made peace with the humans 100 years ago, but it requires the humans to send a sacrifice to symbolize that humans and monsters are not equals. As Sari looks out the window, the king grabs onto her, telling her that she didn't have permission to leave his room, so he carries her back. Sari tells him that his room looks boring, so she suggests putting some flowers in the room, but the king claims he doesn't like flowers, revealing that flowers don't even grow in that land because of the miasma. The king warns her that she will be killed by the other monsters in the palace if they see her, so she should do what he says, making Sari realize that the king is worried about her. The king grabs her by the neck, threatening to kill her, but the girl is not scared, claiming that she has seen worse. In a flashback, Sari learns that her name means sacrifice, so she goes to her parents, knowing that the next sacrifice is going to be from their village. At that moment, she overhears them talking about how they took her in, to raise her as a sacrifice. Her parents notice her presence, and the room is illuminated by lightning as they stare at her. To this day, she still remembers the scary look in their eyes. And she tells the king that his eyes are different, so she is not afraid of him, and the king starts to take pity on her. They go to an old fortress city, which was damaged during their war with the humans a hundred years ago. While the king is inspecting it, Sari sees the ruins of the lower town. The king explains that it's a lawless zone, where the monsters often cause trouble with humans, and it's his duty to stop that from happening. Sari sees flowers growing in the city, and the king explains that the miasma in the area is thin, so it's the only place in the land where flowers can grow. She takes some flowers from the garden, and puts a crown of flowers on the king's head, telling him that he looks adorable, but the king removes it, thinking that she is mocking him. Sari says that he always has a scary look on his face, so she wants to make the king feel better by making him look at the flowers. But the king grabs onto her, telling her that a storm is approaching. They head back to his room, where he tells her that the night of revelation is approaching. Lightning strikes, causing Sari to panic, because she remembers the look in her parents' eyes. The king covers her with his tail, so she won't panic when lightning strikes. Sari says that she is no longer scared, because the king is so warm, telling him that he doesn't need to act tough around her. On the night of revelation, they prepare Sari for the ritual of sacrifice, and she is happy because she gets to wear such beautiful clothes, thinking that it's like a wedding dress. Anubis escorts her to the altar chamber, where she will wait for the king's arrival, but she is ambushed by a lizard monster, who plans to overthrow the king. He thinks that killing her will help him with his goal, so he tries to attack her with his knife but a cloaked man gets in his way, blocking the knife with his hand. The lizard thinks that he is an agent of the king, calling the king a coward, but Sari exclaims that they have a great king who prevents needless bloodshed. The lizard attacks again, slicing through the man's cloak and revealing his face. He disarms the lizard, pointing his sword against him and making the monster run away. Sari realizes that he is the king, but he points her to the exit as he explains that he is no king because he is actually half-human, 
revealing that the Knight of Revelation turns him into a human, so he has to hide in darkness until he turns back into a beast. The king feels bad, thinking that he is a pitiful weakling who is unworthy to be king, but Sari covers his wound, saying that he is not weak. Sari realizes that he didn't eat any of the past sacrifices, seeing that he has plenty of scars on his arms, and we learn that he used his own blood to make the other beasts think that the sacrifices were devoured during the ritual. She says that a weak person could never do that, so she calls him the strongest, saying that she wants to serve as nourishment for him instead of going home. Her chains break as the king hugs her, and the next day, the king informs everyone that Sari is going to be the queen. His subjects are not happy with this, so he challenges them to step forward, putting them in their place. Sari thinks about calling him Lanhart, which means brave-hearted, and he accepts it, saying he can live with that. Later, we see two officials begging him to reconsider his decision, because the queen should descend from a noble lineage, but the king scares them into submission. Sari is walking around the palace again, so Sayak and Klops warn her that the king will be mad again, but she isn't afraid of the king, because she knows he is actually a good person who is trying to protect everyone. At that moment, the king appears, lifting her off the ground, and taking her back to the room, where he tells her to wait quietly, but Sari wants to help him out, so he tells her to join the court banquet, where the nobles of the land will gather. The king reveals that his officials proposed it to him, thinking that it would change his mind about making Sari his queen, but he tells Sari to hold her head high. That evening, the king returns to his room, where he sees Sari sleeping by the window. He carries her, and she screams as she wakes up, apologizing for falling asleep while he was working. The king sees flowers on her lap, and she reveals that they are artificial flowers that she made, to help him relax whenever he returns to his room. The king says he is not interested in flowers, but he thinks that artificial flowers suit him, because he is also a sham that has a lot to hide. Sari thinks that it doesn't matter if it's artificial, as long as it can touch people's hearts, and she tells him that he is like the bees that land on the flowers, because they are gentle and hard-working despite their scary appearance. She assures Lanhart that he is not fake, even wanting to be like him as she falls asleep. Guests from all over the land visit their castle, and Anubis tells Sari to behave herself during the event, seeing her as a hindrance to the king. They hold the banquet, where the guests are looking forward to seeing the new queen. Anubis tells them to stay silent, as the king makes his entrance, but the guests are shocked as they see the king carrying Sari, mocking her appearance, and making rude remarks, since they look down on humans. The king demands silence, and Sari holds her head high, as Anubis tells the guests to enjoy the banquet. They sit on their thrones, but Sari notices the guests glaring at her, so she stands up, and serves a guest some food, making everyone surprised. The guest tries the food, finding it delicious, and all the other guests start enjoying the banquet. Sari goes to the kitchen to help serve the food, but she encounters some monsters who don't want to let her enter, since she's human. Cyanclops tell them that she is the queen, so their head chef lets her enter. She gets food from the kitchen, and even helps with cleaning the tables, but a chameleon monster still finds her suspicious. Sari sees a strange wine, which is said to be a gift from a trading city, so she takes it to the king, but the chameleon monster uses his tail to make her fall. She accidentally pours the wine on the king, and the chameleon condemns her, claiming that she did it on purpose. The guests stare at her, but the king licks her face and acts cool. He grabs the chameleon's tail, knowing that he used it to make Sari fall, and reminds him that Sari is his queen, and he threatens to kill him with his claws, but Sari stops him. Leonhardt spares his life, telling him that he owes his life to the queen. After the banquet, Sari thinks about what happened, when the floor suddenly starts glowing around her. The king appears, and she grabs onto him, as a holy beast named Gwibber takes them to the air. They start flying away from the castle, and the king thinks that the gusty upper airs would make her feel better, and Sari is relieved, because she thought that the king was going to get rid of her, seeing herself as a burden. They land on the ground, and the king calls her a fool, telling her that she is already a part of him, so he won't get rid of her. She is worried that he'll end up hurting someone like the chameleon, but he is sure that she will stop him if something like that happens again. He tells her that he carries a heavy burden as a false king, and it's only when he is around her that he feels truly free, even saying that he can become a better king with her at his side, so he wants her to stay with him. 
Sari studies about the monster kingdom of Osmargo, thinking that she needs to learn about it, but she is having a hard time taking it all in. Anubis reluctantly agrees to teaching her because the king ordered it, but he thinks that he is just wasting his time, so he goes back to his other duties. Sari goes outside with Lanhart, as she wears a beast costume so she won't look too conspicuous. She sees his weird disguise, making her laugh because he looks too suspicious. They walk along a busy street, where she discovers how normal beasts live their lives, thinking that they aren't so different from humans. She sees a bakery, and she is happy to see some bread, saying there is no bread in the palace. The baker's family hears this, so they become suspicious, but the baker tells them that the king would never dress up as such a shady character. We learn that the royals and aristocrats took all the rarities under the last king, but the current king doesn't care about delicacies or fancy decorations, which is good for their bakery. They end up buying some bread, and Sari feeds it to Lanhart, who thinks that it's nothing special. As they eat bread, she hears a child monster named Bolas crying, because he got separated from his mother. They help Bolas find his mother, but as they walk, Sari suddenly feels dizzy, so Lanhart takes Bolas from her, as she wonders what is going on. Bolas starts crying, and Sari assures him that they will find his mother. His mother finally sees him, thanking Sari for her help, but as Bolas falls from the king's head, Sari catches her, revealing her human face to everyone. Bolas's mother suddenly acts hostile, telling her not to touch her child, as the other monsters make rude remarks just because she's human. They start throwing stones at her, so the king unleashes his aura, obscuring their vision, and disappearing with Sari. They return to the palace, where Anubis informs him about a report that a human was spotted in the city, but he ignores it, along with the other requests that are presented to him. Sari apologizes for all the trouble that she caused, knowing that she scared all the townspeople. She notes that it is similar to how humans react to beasts, and she thinks that it's because the two races have a history of war between them, but she is convinced that both races don't like conflict. The king apologizes to her, because he exposed her to danger, saying that he let his guard down, but he admits that he enjoyed his day with her. Sari tells him not to apologize, as she hugs him, telling him that she also had fun, but she suddenly blacks out. Anubis is talking to a priest, who reveals that Sari's health is declining because of the miasma, and it could eventually lead to her death. Sari tells the king not to worry about her, but the king knows that she can't stay in the kingdom. She later wakes up on a bed, seeing the blue sky, and she realizes that she is living with humans again. A doctor approaches her, informing her that she is in his clinic. She learns that she was brought in because of miasma poisoning, so they think that she must have come from the border, where the wind can blow miasma to their side. They give her medicine that's made from the ambrosia fruit, to help purify the miasma in her body. The assistant explains that someone left her unconscious in front of the clinic three days ago, with more than enough money for her treatment, as well as a note. Sari looks at it, recognizing the royal seal, but she can't understand what's written on it because it's in beast writing. However, it was enough for her to realize that the king saved her life. After that, Sari helps out at the clinic, while the assistant warns her not to force herself because she still hasn't recovered. She starts living peacefully in the town, and the assistant is happy with her performance, telling her that she can stay with them. Sari thinks about returning to the king, but she knows that she can't live there, because she will just make the king worried. The villagers start talking about her, and they learn that she came from the village that sent a sacrifice. They suddenly start shunning her, as they talk behind her back. She notices this, and she remembers how the monsters in the city acted hostile toward her, so she starts running back to the clinic. But when she reaches the clinic, she discovers that they have been attacked, and the doctor tells her to leave, because the townspeople think that she is a sacrifice that escaped from the beasts, fearing that the beast king will destroy the town while searching for her. She starts wandering on her own, knowing that she has nowhere to go, so she starts crying, and she is about to fall down the cliff. But the king arrives in his human form, grabbing onto her in the nick of time. She asks him what he's doing there in human form, and the king reveals that he turns into a human whenever he's in the human realm, because there is no miasma. Sari thought that the king abandoned her, but he reveals that the letter states that he would come back for her. He gives her a ring with a crystallized ambrosia fruit, telling her that it will purify the miasma as it enters her body, so she can now stay with him. Sari returns to the palace, where Sai and Klops are glad to see her again. 
She wants to learn more about the kingdom, wanting to see its people with her own eyes, so she can stay by his side. Leonhard thinks that the ring will help her develop an immunity to the miasma, and tells her she can remove it after she becomes immune. But Sari doesn't want to remove it, mentioning what it means to give a human a ring. The king has no idea, and Sari says it's a promise to stay together forever. While walking around the palace, Sari encounters a princess named Vivian, who is there to ask for the king's hand in marriage. We learn that this was arranged by Anubis, saying Sari's appearance at the banquet was met with protests, so he is looking for a new queen to improve their relationship with their peers. More princesses arrive, and they are all there for the same reason. Vivian explains how they won't be able to face their countrymen if the king doesn't accept them, as concubines at least, before she walks away. That evening, Sari suggests granting the princesses an audience, but the king calls it a waste of time because he's not interested in keeping concubines, saying Anubis arranged this on his own. The king explains that concubines could be a threat to her position as queen, but Sari doesn't want to hold him back. The king becomes upset, saying they're done discussing the matter, and tells her to go to sleep. Sari hides in her watcher's room, where she wonders why the king was so worked up, because he doesn't normally lose his temper, so she thinks about returning to him. Meanwhile, Vivian enters the king's quarters, trying to seduce him into accepting her as a concubine, as she explains how the king can't make love with a human. Sari overhears this and enters the king's quarters, but she finds them in an awkward position, so she apologizes and runs away. The king gets upset, telling Vivian to leave, and Sari returns to her watcher's room, spending the night with them. The next day, they join the princesses at the dining table, but Vivian is nowhere to be found. The reptile princess named Amit accidentally drops her plate, so Sari cleans her up, accompanying her outside. While outside, Amit reveals she is afraid of the king, but she is there because reptilians face persecution. She is forbidden from returning home if she doesn't win the king's heart, so she has essentially been exiled. At that moment, they received news that the royal guard has returned, and the guard captain Jorman enters the palace, wanting to meet the king immediately. He sees Sari, recognizing her as the queen, so he kneels before her, as he reveals he has sworn loyalty to the king. We learn that Jorman was once a commoner, but he rose through the ranks, managing to earn the king's trust. Ahmed is in love with him, revealing how Jorman used his royal guard's scarf to cover her wound in the past. She still has it with her, wanting to return it to him. She explains how he makes her heart race, and Sari thinks that the king makes her feel the same way. That evening, Sari is about to attend a banquet, but she sees Amit brooding in the corner, because her dress is ruined. The other princesses laugh at her, making Sari think they are the ones behind it. Amit wants to spend time with Jorman at the banquet, but thinks he's beyond her reach, so Sari removes her dress and lets her borrow it. Sari attends the event in her usual outfit, and Amit arrives wearing Sari's dress, returning Jorman's scarf to him and making him remember her. As Sari drinks from her cup, she sees Vivian glancing at her, and the drink causes her to black out. She later wakes up, but Vivian approaches her, grabbing her by the neck, as she asks Sari to make way for her to be queen. However, Sari comments that she wouldn't stand a chance, even if she isn't around. This makes Vivian furious, threatening to kill Sari with her claws, but Amit grabs onto her, telling Sari to run. Amit gets knocked down, as Vivian lunges at them, but the king saves them, telling her to never show herself again, as the guards take her away. The king apologizes for speaking harshly the previous night, while Anubis thinks about how the princesses were all sent home, unable to move the king's heart. But Amit stays behind, having received permission to stay as Sari's friend. The king tells Sari that she is the only woman he desires, and this makes her realize that she really is in love with the king. Jorman escorts Sari to a meeting, as he explains that Anubis will do anything to protect the king's throne, even if it means defying the king's will. At the meeting, Anubis receives Sari as their formal queen, saying he has considered the king's feelings, but he imposes certain conditions, saying Sari must become the most accomplished consort in history for the people to accept her. The first condition is to command a holy beast, because it's seen as a symbol of royal authority. This makes the king angry, because Sari has no magical power, so her life would be consumed instead, and she might also end up summoning a demon instead, which would lead to a fate worse than death. He ends the meeting, saying he doesn't need to entertain such a proposal. As they walk back to their quarters, Sari thinks there will be chaos in the kingdom because of her, 
but the king assures her that he will keep her safe. Sari watches Jorman as he trains the other soldiers, thinking about how everyone is doing their parts, so she wonders what she can do for the king. The next day, the king sees Sari putting her blood on the contract, so he asks her what she's doing. Sari states it's the right thing to do, saying she needs to win everyone's acceptance to protect him. She draws a sigil on the floor, trying to summon a holy beast, but she suddenly gets a bad feeling, as her strength is drained away. This causes her to fall to her knees, as the sigil blows her away, because she stopped before finishing the incantation. She tries it again, but the spell fails, causing her to collapse. The next day, she tries again, drawing the magic circle, as Klops comments that she'll be in danger if she keeps failing, because a human shouldn't try summoning more than twice a day. She ends up failing again, and the king catches her in midair, ready to take her away, but Anubis stops him, explaining how the pledge forbids her from seeking aid. The king states he is not aiding her, but just granting her a brief rest, taking her back to his quarters. Sari claims she's fine, but the king knows she will die if she continues. Sari doesn't value her life, but the king calls her a fool, as he explains he doesn't want to lose her. The next day, Sari tries to summon a holy beast again, and a flame comes out of the circle, before she could finish her incantation. Anubis thinks she has summoned a demon, but Sari continues chanting as the flame surrounds her. The spell is successful, and a tiny beast appears in the circle. Sari collapses, as the king compliments her for her performance. While Sari rests on the bed, they offer her some food, but her holy beast keeps eating everything, leaving nothing for her to eat. The holy beast explains he is the only one with the powers of immortality and rebirth, introducing himself as Benyu. He claims he was once the most beautiful holy beast in existence, calling himself a phoenix. Anubis arrives in the room, saying Benyu can't possibly be a phoenix, and Benyu tries to pick a fight with him. They can't understand what he's saying, and we learn that only the summoner can understand the holy beast. Anubis doesn't think the people will accept Benyu as the queen's holy beast, saying it needs to have a more regal form. Later, Sari wears a bird costume, and tries to teach Benyu how to fly, but they aren't making progress, so Benyu decides to quit. Benyu reveals he has already used all of his powers, and we learn he was once overworked by the soldiers during a war. He says he'll never be able to fly again, but Sari tells him not to put himself down, saying he gave her so much confidence despite his current form. The next day, Sari sees Benyu trying to fly, as an assassin is targeting him. Benyu jumps off the castle wall, and it looks like he is about to fly, but an arrow almost hits him, causing him to fall. Sari dives after him, and he calls her an idiot for trying to save an immortal bird, but he is touched by her actions, and he awakens his powers, transforming into a real phoenix. Benyu reveals he will always come back if she believes in him, as he flies around the town, making everyone acknowledge him as a holy beast. At the palace gate, a guard is attacked by a mysterious man, saying he has business with the king of monsters. He ends up getting captured, and the king goes to him while he is chained in the dungeon. The man asks him if he killed Sari, but Sari happens to appear at that moment, recognizing him as Ilya. Ilya is happy to learn she is still alive, and Sari implores the king to pardon Ilya, saying she will accept his punishment instead. So the king claims that Ilya is his guest, and he only attacked because he didn't know how to ring the doorbell. The king wants to know about Sari's relationship with him, and in a flashback, we meet a young Ilya. As he is walking around the town, Sari goes to him, giving him some medicinal herbs, because he's always hurt, but Ilya says it's normal to get hurt, since he is training to become a warrior, and Ilya promises he will keep her safe, even from the beasts. Back in the present, Ilya is released from his chains, as Anubis tells him never to return to their realm. Sari arrives, and Ilya immediately grabs her hand, telling her he's taking her home, but Sai and Klops tell him that she is living with them now. Ilya kicks them away, wanting to leave with Sari, but she chooses to stay with the king. The king reveals that Sari is going to become his queen, ordering the guards to take Ilya away. Ilya grabs onto him, but collapses, and Sari worries about him. Anubis says it's because of fatigue, so the king allows him to stay overnight. They give Ilya some food, but he doesn't eat anything despite being hungry. He asks Sari if she's really going to become the queen, which she confirms, but Ilya tells her not to worry, because he plans to escape with her. Amit joins them in the room, offering Ilya some desserts, but he slaps it away, telling her to leave. 
Ilya wonders what's wrong with Sari, because she's too friendly with the beasts. He thinks the king will just toy with her, but Sari tells him that the king isn't like that, saying he is even willing to make sacrifices for humans. She tells Ilya she can't go with him, making him fall silent, as she leaves to get more food. After she leaves the room, she is approached by Ahmet, who thinks she was too forward with Ilya. Sari claims Ilya is also kind, telling her about how Ilya wanted to protect her back when they were kids. Sari tells her that he just has a sore spot for beasts, but he isn't violent for no reason. The king sees Sari giving Ilya food, and Anubis comments on how she must find comfort in spending time with another human. She returns to Ilya's room, giving him his dinner, but Ilya doesn't talk, so she tells him that they may never be able to see each other again after he leaves. But Ilya knocks her unconscious, and he tries to escape with her. The king learns about this, and Ilya is now riding a horse back to the human realm. The king chooses to pursue Ilya himself, but Anubis suggests that maybe Sari chose to go with him, since they are both humans. The king starts to think that Sari could be happier in the human realm, but Amun implores the king to rescue Sari, knowing how much she loves the king. Jormin arrives, offering to take care of Ilya, but the king summons his holy beast, telling Jormin to take charge in his absence. As Gwibber tries to track Ilya, Benyu appears, offering to help them, because he shares his soul with Sari, so he knows her location. He guides them to his master, as Ilya reaches the Hyena Folk's territory, where his path is blocked by some monsters. They tell Ilya they will let him go, if he leaves Sari with them so they can eat her. But this makes him angry, so he attacks them, killing them one by one. One of the hyenas run, but Ilya catches up to him. The monster's son appears, begging him not to kill his father, but Ilya raises his sword, ready to strike them down. However, Sari grabs onto him, allowing the monsters to escape. Sari asks him why he would kill a child, but Ilya just sees all monsters as a threat to humans. Sari reminds him how he trained only to protect humans from monsters, but Ilya tells her it's not enough, thinking Sari is under a spell, so he thinks about killing monsters just to wake her up. He throws her on a bed, as he confesses his love to her, but Sari rejects him, telling him he is terrifying. She tries to tell Ilya that not all monsters are evil, and that the king has a kind heart, but he doesn't believe her, explaining how the monsters see humans as prey. In a flashback, we see Ilya with his sister Misha, who is afraid that the monsters will come for her, so Ilya promises to protect her from monsters. But one day, their mother returns to their house, making them hide in the closet, as she gets slaughtered by the monsters. The monsters find them, opening the cabinet, and they think about eating one of them for dessert. They take Misha away, eating her before his eyes, but they don't like how boys taste, so they decide to toy with him, letting him run away before they get him, but he ended up getting saved by his master. He saw a new ray of hope when he met Sari, but it was also taken away from him by the monsters. Back in the present, Ilya thinks about killing all monsters, tying Sari's hands to some wooden columns, as he tells her to watch him. At that moment, the king arrives, telling him to return Sari, but Ilya claims that Sari belongs to him. Ilya charges at the king, and they start fighting, as Benny goes to Sari, telling her how Ilya is no match. Ilya knows this himself, but he refuses to back down, thinking the monsters will kill more humans if he does. He disappears before the king's eyes, pinning down his cape, as he jumps to strike him down, but the king unleashes his aura, blowing him away. Ilya still refuses to give up, telling the king to kill him, because he wants Sari to see how violent monsters are. He charges at the king, but the king allows him to stab him, saying Sari would be sad if he hurt Ilya. Benya helps Sari get free, and she immediately checks up on the king, as she starts crying, while Ilya falls to his knees, realizing how he just made her upset. The king claims the wound is nothing to him, and Ilya starts questioning everything he has been doing. But Sari hugs him, telling him he has done so much for her, so he should forgive himself. Benya heals the king's wound, and he transforms into a phoenix to transport Ilya, but he refuses to accept help from the monsters, choosing to go back alone. Ilya tells the king he has to give up Sari if he makes her cry, and the king gives him his word. Ilya ends up riding with Sari to return to the human kingdom, and Sari teases him for being afraid of heights. Ilya apologizes for acting so selfishly, and although he can never forgive the monsters, he decides to have faith in her belief in the king. He kisses her forehead, telling her he loves her, as they part ways. Sari flies back with the king, 
who tells her that he hesitated to bring her back because he thought she could be happier with Ilya. But Sari says she just wants to be with him no matter what. Back at the palace, Sari receives news that the Duke Gallius wants to meet her. She is excited to meet the Duke, but Anubis warns her not to take this matter lightly, saying she needs to play hostess to the Duke and proposing this as one of her ordeals on her path to queenship. Ahmed is surprised to learn about this, and she recognizes Gallius as a legendary general known as the Sea God. She warns Sari that Gallius hates humans, so she advises Sari to be careful. Sari asks the king about Gallius, and he reveals that Gallius is known for his ruthless behavior, but the king assures her that he won't let Gallius harm her. Gallius arrives in the castle, as Anubis gives him a proper welcome, but Gallius tells him to skip the formalities, wanting to see the queen. Sari joins them, introducing herself as the hostess, but Gallius becomes upset, not wanting to accept a human as the queen. His servant tries to calm him down, but Gallius threatens him with his sword. At that moment, the king joins them, saying he won't permit disturbances in the palace, and Gallius bows to him, but he tells the king that he won't accept a human as their queen. The king becomes upset, but Sari tells Gallius that she understands why he feels that way, because they never had a human queen before. She takes them to the courtyard, telling them about its history, but Gallius makes a loud noise, causing her to forget her script. Gallius realizes that she just memorized her lines, so he disparages her, telling her that she disgusts him as he starts walking away. During dinner, Sari leads the toast, but she doesn't drink the wine that Gallius brought with him. Gallius inquires about this, and Anubis explains that Beast Wine disagrees with her. Gallius tells her that she isn't fit to be queen, saying humans are unreliable, so his servant tries to stop him, but Gallius hits him, saying he can't eat while looking at his ugly face. Gallius states that Sari also makes him lose his appetite, ordering her to leave, so Sari excuses herself, making her way back to the king's quarters. Back in the room, the king gives her his food, revealing that he wasn't able to eat anything because he couldn't stand Gallius's behavior. Sari tells the king not to worry about her because she's used to being treated that way, saying she can't leave him with a foul temper, so she needs to turn things around at the ball. Sari tells him that she's done eating the food, so she wants him to eat her leftovers, but the king licks her instead, asking her to show them that he was right to choose her. That evening, Sari asks Gallius to dance with her, but he declines, and Anubis informs him that they will cancel the ball if he doesn't dance with Sari. Gallius orders his ugly servant to dance with her instead, and they dance together, as the servant asks Sari to forgive him, thinking his ugly appearance disgusts her. But Sari tells him this isn't the case, saying he appears to be in so much pain. The servant reveals that he received his wounds during the last war, where he was burned by humans. He tells her that war has divided humans and beasts, so she will have a hard time as the queen of the beasts, wondering why she even wants to be their queen. Sari states that she just wants to be with the king, wanting to help him in any way she can. They appear to be enjoying their time together, but Gallius suddenly hits his servant, saying it's not fun watching him befriend a human, and he pulls out his sword. However, Sari gets in the way, as Gallius tells her to move, reminding her that she'll never be the legitimate queen if she fails the ordeal. He gives her a choice, saying she can either make the smart move for her future by moving away, or be destroyed with his ugly servant. Sari chooses to give up her future as queen, and Gallius is surprised by her decision. The servant reminds her about her goal to stay by the king's side, but Sari states that she can't be a queen if she ignores the people who are getting hurt. Sari starts questioning Gallius's identity, saying he bullies people who can't fight back, so she wonders if he's really the legendary sea god. Gallius swings his sword, but the ugly servant stops him, telling him he's done enough. He suddenly bows down, and we learn that the ugly servant is actually the real Gallius, and the shark is his grandson named Jaws. Gallius explains that the king has improved the quality of their lives, but they went to the palace because they heard news that he wants to take a human as his queen. They wanted to test Sari by putting on act, claiming that the entire deception was his idea, so he begs the king to spare his men from punishment. However, Jaws implores the king to punish him instead of Gallius, because their race can't survive without him. Sari asks the king if they still need to be punished, saying nothing bad happened to her, but the king states that they deserve to be punished. He orders Gallius and his men to swear perpetual allegiance to him, telling them to defend the realm for him. Gallius thanks the king for his mercy, 
swearing allegiance to the king and his queen, and they sail back to their home. The next day, Anubis tells the king that Sari is now disqualified from queenship, because she gave up her future as queen. The king states that she performed her duties well, but Anubis still refuses to consider the ordeal a success. The king returns to his quarters, and Sari notices that something is bothering him, but he doesn't tell her about it, thinking it will make her regret her actions. Anubis reprimands two guards for being noisy, and as he walks away, he overhears the guards talking about Sari, thinking humans are bad. But Anubis doesn't share their sentiment, thinking Sari tricked the king to save her own skin, so he wants to get rid of her. While walking, he stumbles upon Sari, and he leads her to a nearby library. As she starts searching for a book, Anubis realizes that they're alone in that area, so he thinks about killing her. He is about to do it, but Sari pulls out a book, causing the other books to fall on Anubis. Sari checks up on him, telling him she'll look for the book herself, but Anubis offers to help her out. Sari appears to be oblivious of his intentions, so he wonders if she's stupid, as he thinks about proceeding with his plan, but he suddenly passes out. In a flashback, we see a young Anubis refusing to go to his father's funeral. His servant tells him that he is about to become the successor, but Anubis doesn't want this, because this would make him the royal family's lapdog. We learn that his family has served the royal family for generations, and his father died trying to protect the king from assassins, but none of the royals mourned his death, seeing him as just another pawn. One day, he meets up with the king, who thinks he's too young to assume his father's duties, so he orders Anubis to look after the prince. He formally introduces himself to the prince, and he starts serving him, but Anubis sees the prince as a fool, so he thinks he could take control after the prince succeeds the throne. Anubis falls ill, and he overhears the servants talking about how weak he is, wondering if he will be able to succeed his father. This makes Anubis upset, because he doesn't want to be like his father, as he remembers that his father never visited him when he was sick. At that moment, he feels a presence, and he realizes that the prince is in his room, checking up on him. The prince reveals that no one saw him enter, as he gives him a basket of healthy foods, telling him to eat plenty and get well. Anubis wonders why he's doing this, and the prince reveals that he is worried about him. Anubis is surprised to hear this, because he wasn't expecting the prince to be concerned about his servant. The prince reminds him that his father saved the king, and he is really grateful for this, saying he loves his father. Anubis tells him to leave the room, but suddenly, two beasts enter the room, and they are both taken away. Anubis wakes up inside a cave, where the kidnappers thank him for helping them catch the prince. They talk about taking the king's head, and Anubis realizes that they are the assassins who killed his father. Anubis bites one of them, telling him to give his father back, but the assassin pushes him back, and tells him that the members of his family die as the shadows of royalty. They think fate must have brought him to them, because their plan is to kill him and hold the prince hostage. One of them is about to kill him, but the prince protects him, which surprises Anubis. The prince stands against the assassins, as Anubis tells him to stop, but the prince states that it's a king's duty to protect everyone. He thinks that if he can't even protect a friend, then he wouldn't make a good king. The prince unleashes his aura, causing rocks to fall on the assassins, but he suddenly collapses, so Anubis checks up on him. The prince is happy that Anubis is okay, and this causes him to cry, as he starts dragging the prince away, until they are rescued by a search party. Back in his house, his servant tells him that the prince made a plea with the king, telling him not to hold Anubis accountable, because the prince didn't want to tarnish his family's reputation. Anubis realizes that he has found the king he wants to serve, so he visits the prince, apologizing for failing to protect him, and devoting himself to making the prince the best king. Back in the present, Anubis wakes up, and Sari tells him that he collapsed in the library. She is about to touch him, but he slaps her hand away, because he doesn't want to accept her as queen, saying he doesn't trust her. However, Sari doesn't seem to care, telling him that the king is worried about him. She tells him to think about her next ordeal, and she leaves the room. During their next meeting, Anubis states that Sari has succeeded in her ordeal, surprising everyone in the room. He has decided to give Sari a chance, wanting to see if she deserves the king's heart. Sari sees the statues of the first king and his queen consort, and Klops reveals that the first king was the hero who united the beasts. Sari wonders why she hasn't been able to enter this area before, 
so Klops explains that this is a sacred place, and it's only open during certain occasions like the Grand Consecration. The Grand Consecration is an event where the people gather for a celebration, which the king will lead while wearing the first king's clothes. Sari makes her way to the king, and she sees him trying on the clothes. He orders everyone but Sari to leave the room, and he reveals that a storm is going to drive the miasma away from the realm, so they're going to have another night of revelation. That evening, Sari looks after the king in his human form, as he reveals that he is always nervous before he faces the people, because they might learn about his secret, but he feels better when he's around Sari. The next day, the beasts gather for the grand consecration, but the king is still in his human form, because the miasma still hasn't filled the air. The king knows that he will regain his beast form, but it will take time, and the grand consecration is about to begin. At the venue of the event, Anubis learns that the king is nowhere to be found. He recalls that no king has ever been late for the event, so he orders the servants to look for the king. The servants claim that they have searched all areas, but the judge named Set suggests searching the underground chamber, saying the king must be meditating before the event. They enter the chamber, but they realize that it's empty, and we learn that the king used a secret passage to escape. They sneak past the guards, but they are about to be spotted, so Sari distracts them. Jorman asks her about the king's whereabouts, and she tells him that she's also looking for the king, but she couldn't find him there, so the guards walk away. Sari and the king make their way back to the underground chamber, where the king starts transforming into a beast, but he thinks that he won't be able to make it on time for the grand consecration, so he starts to think that he's not a good king. Sari tells him that he's a great king, and at that moment, the king senses a presence, so Sari leaves the room to buy time for him. She sees Seth standing at the entrance, and he tells her that he senses magic in that room. Sari tells him that the king is concentrating, but Set calls her a liar, saying he's concerned about the king's safety, and asking her to open the door. Sari refuses to cooperate, so Set orders a guard to restrain her, as they open the door. They see the king in his beast form, and Set wonders what he's been doing all this time. The bell rings as the grand consecration begins, and Set tells him that he doesn't have enough time to dress up, but the king says he will go without it. At the venue, the beasts wonder why the king isn't there, because the king is always on time for the event. Anubis starts to panic, ordering the servants to cancel the ceremony, but at that moment, they see the king riding Gwibber, and he stands before everyone wearing his usual cloak. The beasts wonder what's going on. He tells the people that he has cast off the first king's armor, saying he respects tradition, but he reminds them about his duty to serve the realm. The king explains that he can't fulfill his duty by following his ancestors' footsteps, so they need to make changes for them to move forward, promising to lead them to a brighter future. The crowd cheers for the king, and Anubis tells him that he made a good speech, but he wonders why the king didn't inform him about his bold plan. The king states that it's because he would have objected, saying Sari gave him the idea for his speech. Anubis admits that he's impressed, and Sari wonders why he still hasn't given her an ordeal. At the conference room, Anubis tells her that he has no ordeals to give her, saying she will now take her place as the acting queen consort. Anubis asks her to perform the queen's public duties, saying that if she can do so without incident until the next grand consecration, she will be recognized as the queen consort in full. Anubis warns her that her public presence will be met with protest, and he will send her back to the human realm if she fails to perform her duties. He gives her an option, saying she could decline the position of acting queen consort, so that they can find a wife for the king, and she can stay in the palace as the king's pet. Sari takes her time to think about this, and Benyu tells her to accept the position, thinking she's the only one who can make the king great. Sari makes up her mind, as Benyu transforms into a phoenix, pushing her to the king's arms. She tells the king that she will take the position of acting queen consort, and the king is happy to hear this, saying he will share responsibilities with her. After some time, envoys arrive from all over the kingdom, wanting to talk to the king about the acting queen consort, but the king orders his servants to turn them away, because Sari still hasn't done anything. Ahmed visits Sari, as she tries on her new clothes, because Anubis told her that her normal clothes were too shabby for a queen's work. Ahmed tells her that she's so composed, because the kingdom is in turmoil, but Sari knows that brooding will do nothing, so she's just going to do what she can. As Ahmet walks around the palace, she overhears royal guards talking about subduing a band of rebels, and this makes her realize that Jorman is undertaking perilous missions. 
She realizes that both Sari and Jorman are faced with challenging tasks, so she creates charms for both of them, thinking it will give them protection. The next day, Ahmed overhears Jorman prohibiting a royal guard to march with them because he knows that the guard has a family. The guard asks Jorman if he will ever marry, but Jorman tells him that he is too focused on his duties, so he has no intention of getting married. Ahmet gives Sari an amulet, and she notices that Ahmet is holding onto another one, asking her who it's for. Ahmet tells her that it's for Jorman, as she shamefully admits that she wants Jorman to notice her. But Sari tells her that it's nothing to be ashamed of, saying they aren't so different, because she feels greedy for wanting to stay with the king despite being human, and she tells Ahmet that she should also be greedy. Ahmet rushes to Jorman, and she gives him the amulet, saying she imbued it with charms to protect him during his mission. Jorman accepts it, promising to return from his mission in scathed so that her reputation won't be tarnished, and Sari is happy to see this. While she is walking around the palace, the king tells her that her first duty as acting queen has been decided. They ride a carriage to the vassal state called Sarbel, as the king tells her that the Sarbel's ruler, Ted and his consort Kaura, have a newborn son named Kalkara. As acting queen consort, she must give Kalkara her blessings, saying Osmargo hasn't had a queen for years, so that task was performed by the priestesses for many years. Meanwhile, Kaura begs Tet to refuse the rite of blessing, because she doesn't want a human to touch her son, but Tet reminds her that they're a vassal state, so they must abide by Osmargo's customs. They arrive at Sarbel, and Tet welcomes the king to their state. Sari introduces herself as the acting queen consort, saying she will give their son her blessings. Kaura gives her a cold stare, saying their son is not feeling well, but he should be ready to receive the blessing tomorrow. During dinner, Sari is treated as a proper guest, but she drops her fork, and she suddenly starts to feel dizzy. The king notices that something's wrong, so he stands up, saying he's tired so he will have to rest early. He brings Sari with him to their room, where Sari reveals that Kaura's actions remind her of her parents, who raised her as a sacrifice, saying she could hardly breathe because of it. The king cuddles her, telling her that he doesn't know what to say, so he just imitated her actions, and this makes her feel better, knowing that the king is at her side. The following day, Sari is about to give Kalkara her blessings, but he suddenly starts crying, so Kaura asks to postpone the blessings. Sari agrees to this, as Anubis notes that Kaura is fond of her only son, so he suspects that she is planning to avoid the rite of blessings at any cost, wondering what Sari will do to fulfill her duty. While outside, Sari offers to soothe Kalkara, but Kaura tells her that she'll take care of it, asking her to have a look around the palace in the meantime, and Kaura's daughter, Tetra, volunteers to show Sari around. After Kaura leaves, Tetra immediately calls Sari ugly, saying that must be why her mother doesn't want Sari to hold Kalkara. Tetra claims that she can help Sari, but she must first become her minion and obey everything she says. Sari plays along, as Tetra turns her into a plaything, but Sari appears to be enjoying it. Tetra orders Sari to be her horse, so she gets down on all fours, telling her to climb aboard. Tetra asks Sari what's wrong with her, thinking she's just doing it to gain Kaura's favor, but Sari doesn't seem to care, saying she was having so much fun that it slipped her mind. Sari starts carrying her around, but Tetra calls her an idiot, as she reveals that Kaura doesn't care about her. Kalkara is the heir that her parents always wanted, so all of her elder sisters were married off, and she knows that the same thing will happen to her in the future, thinking Kaura wants to get rid of her. But Sari disagrees, saying Kaura loves her, but she doesn't know how to show it. Tetra still thinks she's an unwanted child, and she swiftly makes her way to the tallest tower in the palace, planning to take her own life while the king is there. Sari catches up to her, telling her not to do it, as the king watches them, but Tetra sees her life as irrelevant. Sari states that she wants to play with Tetra again, but she remembers how her mother only stopped crying after she gave birth to Kalkara, thinking her birth didn't make a single person happy. She notices that everyone is now staring at her, and this makes her feel good, because her last act is going to make an impact. At that moment, Kaura arrives, and Sari helps Tetra realize that she is only doing this to grab her mother's attention. Tetra takes a step back, and she starts falling, as Sari jumps after her, holding onto her as Quiver is summoned, saving them from certain death. Sari tells her not to try it again, as she kisses her forehead, saying she is glad that she was born. Hearing this, Tetra starts crying, as she hugs onto Sari. 
Kaora realizes that she was too busy with Kalkara, so she never had the chance to hug Tetra like that, and Ted apologizes to the king for the unsightly spectacle, but the king tells him to prioritize his daughter instead of placating him. Tetra lands safely, and Kaora immediately hugs her, asking Tetra to forgive her, as she thanks Sari for saving her daughter. They proceed with the rite of blessing, where Kaora allows Sari to bless her son. Anubis still refuses to accept Sari as the queen, but he now recognizes her ability to change others. That evening, we see Sari spending time with Tetra, who reveals that she likes Anubis, thinking they would make a good match, because his blood is stronger, so it will allow her to bear children from his race. We learn that the beast's children take after the parent with the stronger bloodline, and Tetra tells Sari that she will have to bear the king's children in the future, so she needs to become familiar with that concept. As she tries to sleep, the king visits her, telling her that they need to talk. He takes her to a secluded place, and they discuss the king's duty to produce an heir, but he knows that the blood in his veins are different, so he isn't sure if he will be able to love his children, revealing that his parents didn't love him either. In a flashback, we learn that the king was raised with no mother and siblings, and his father treated him harshly, locking him up in a cell during the Night of Revelations, but despite this, he still thought that his father was just raising him to become a fine king. While on his deathbed, his father grabs onto him, telling him that he doesn't want to pass the throne to him, because he has filthy blood in his veins. His father reveals how much he hates him, but he suddenly coughs up blood and passes away. The priests thought that his father wanted to hug him before he died, but this is far from the truth. He later learns that his father was mentally ill, but this illness was never revealed to the public, and to this day, he still doesn't know why his father had a child with a human, but he curses his own blood, saying he doesn't want to pass it to his heirs. Sari starts crying, knowing that the king sees his human blood as a curse, so the king cheers her up, telling her that he wasn't able to choose the blood he was born with, but he chose her, saying her presence is a blessing to him. He promises to protect their future children, telling her that he wants her as his queen, as he kisses her. They leave Sarbel, and the king tells Sari not to push herself too hard, because she has just completed her first task. Back in their palace, the king tells Sari to visit the troops stationed in the city of Masha, but he can't accompany her for this task, so she needs to travel alone. The king explains that he didn't want Sari to go alone, but Anubis told him that he needs to visit his dying friend, and the appointment of Masha's ruler needs to be confirmed in the royal presence. Sari accepts the task, telling the king not to worry, because she can handle it alone. The king visits Sari as she packs her things, and she reveals that she is nervous, saying she isn't used to being away from him, but she needs to prove that she can handle the job on her own, so that she can become a good queen. The king leaves the palace, and Anubis tells Sari that she will need a new guard for her trip. He states that it's time for her to pick a captain for the queen's guard, who will serve as her right-hand man, but nobody volunteered to serve her, because she's human. However, a hyenian suddenly steps on Anubis, and he volunteers to be the queen's guard, introducing himself as Lanto. Anubis advises Sari to choose her right-hand man carefully, saying Lanto is too rude to be the queen's guard, and suggesting that they should test his skill in combat, but Lanto suddenly slices his mask, threatening to show off his skills on Anubis. Sari stops him, and she accepts him as the captain of the queen's guard. They make their way to Magia, as Lanto tells the driver to change route, claiming there's a shortcut. Sari asks him why he volunteered to be her guard, so he tells her that he just wanted to be promoted to captain, because it's a high rank for a commoner. He knew that it would be easy to get the position, but he still can't believe that he was the only volunteer, thinking he got lucky because she's human. At that moment, they are attacked by a group of sand serpents, and Sari is about to get eaten, but Lanto saves her, easily defeating the monsters. The guards blame Lanto for their encounter with the sand serpents, thinking he deliberately led them there when he ordered them to change route, but Sari stops them, telling them not to fight each other. Lanto wonders if she finds him suspicious, and Sari tells him that she doesn't know him well enough to doubt him. Lanto reveals that the guards were right about him, saying he wanted them to encounter the sand serpents because he wanted to prove himself by defeating them, but he promises to keep Sari alive, knowing he would be in trouble if she dies. Sari chooses to trust Lanto, telling him that he can use her to make a name for himself, but he should never put other people in danger again. Lanto accepts her offer, and they reach the city of Magia, 
where the soldiers talk about Lanto because he's a Hyenian. Lanto notices this, so he calls them impudent, telling them about his position and saying that he outranks them. The captain of the troops, Tyrene, orders his men to return to their posts and tells Sari to address his men at once because they don't have enough time. Sari appears before the soldiers, introducing herself as the acting queen consort and telling them that the king has a message for them. She states that their services are needed by the kingdom, so they should be proud of their roles as soldiers and perform their duties with discipline. She implores everyone to support the king as she ends her speech. Cyan Klops thinks she did a good job, but Lanto tells her that she needs to be more authoritative because she is the highest ranking person in that area. She meets up with the ruler of Magia named Braun, who tells her that they will hold the signing ceremony tomorrow morning. He explains that there is an anti-monarchist insurgency in the land, and the chaos was prolonged because they have no ruler, but the signing ceremony should make the rebels settle down. That evening, we see the soldiers accusing Lanto of being an anti-monarchist because he's a Hyenian. Lanto prepares to take them on, but Sari stops him, asking them what's happening. The soldiers explain that Lanto looks suspicious, telling her that she must not know about the Hyenians, but she defends Lanto, telling them that she knows how the Hyenians betrayed the kingdom in the past, but she thinks it has nothing to do with him. The soldiers apologize for their behavior, but they tell her that they don't trust her. After they leave, Lanto reveals that the last king executed innocent Hyenians, so he wanted to avenge them by destroying the royal family. He warns Sari that he can lie with a straight face, so she shouldn't trust him, but Sari thinks he's incredibly honest, saying he's not the type of person who can fool people with a clear conscience, so she chooses to trust him. Lanto is touched by her words, and the next day, Sari enters his room, but she can't find him there. She hears someone screaming for help, and we learn that Braun has been attacked by someone. Braun survives the attack, and he describes his attacker as a hooded man with one eye. He was able to tear out the assailant's fur, but its color is unremarkable. The officials begin to wonder how the attacker entered the building, asking Tyrene to explain what happened. At that moment, a soldier speaks up, saying he can name the culprit. Lanto enters the room, and the soldier immediately accuses him of attacking Braun. The officials think he fits the description, so they are convinced that he is guilty, as the soldiers surround him. A soldier asks him what he was doing last night, so Lanto tells them that he fell asleep on top of the building, but they see this as a flimsy excuse. The soldiers are ordered to arrest Lanto, so they charge at him, but Sari gets in the way, saying she will prove Lanto's innocence. The soldiers don't trust her, thinking she will frame someone to help Lanto escape, but Tyrene offers to accompany her, as he takes responsibility for what happened. Lanto is detained until he's cleared of suspicion, and they start looking for the culprit. In the dungeon, Klops tells Lanto that Sari believes in him, as Lanto thinks about Sari's strange behavior, because nobody has ever protected him like she did. In a flashback, we learn that the Hyenians are forced to live apart from the other beasts, but even the Hyenians cut Lanto and his mother off, because his father is not from the Hyenian district. His mother is dying of a disease, and Lanto buys medicine for her, using the money he worked so hard to earn. But as he makes his way back, he encounters two soldiers, who accuse him of stealing the medicine. Lanto explains that he bought it, but they won't believe him, and they proceed to confiscate it. He tries to take it back, but the soldiers knock him down, walking away as Lanto begs them to give it back. Because of this, his mother dies, and he gets the idea that rank is important, thinking it's the reason why the soldiers treated him that way. Back in the present, Lanto realizes that he's a liar, because he told Sari not to trust him, but he always wanted someone to believe in him. The next day, Lanto is released from prison, after the culprit has confessed to his crimes. Sari reveals that she used the fur they collected as evidence, and we learn that humans can distinguish colors better than beasts. Sari went around matching the color of the fur with the other beasts, until they were able to find the species that it belonged to, then they gathered the members of that species, and apprehended the one who behaved suspiciously. A background check reveals that the culprit is an anti-monarchist, and his goal is to prevent the signing ceremony from taking place. They decide to proceed with the ceremony, and Braun is appointed as the ruler of the city. Sari thanks Tyrene for helping her prove Lanto's innocence, hoping to see him again in the future. However, Tyrene thinks that won't be possible, because his men abandoned their posts, allowing the culprit to enter, 
and he knows this is a grave failure on his part, so he's going to lose his position as captain. The captain bids her farewell, and Lanto reveals that he just wanted to climb the ranks because he didn't want to be abused by the people in authority, but he is grateful since she believed in him, swearing loyalty to her. They return to Osmargo, where Sari rests after their journey, as Lanto is presented to the king as the captain of the Queen's Guard. The king asks him if he's a Hyenian, so he boldly asks the king if that's a problem, saying he won't stab the king in the back, because he doesn't really care about him. Anubis tells him to watch his tongue, but Lanto states that he doesn't even work for the king, and Anubis is annoyed by his behavior, reminding him of Sari when she first arrived. They start to argue, but the king roars at them, causing Lanto to tremble in fear. He asks Lanto if he is proud of his own blood, and Lanto tells him that he's proud to be a Hyenian, saying he doesn't hate himself for who he is, as he states that Sari is the only one who gets to boss him around, and the king accepts him as the captain of the queen's guard, telling him to be her knight. Jorman leads his men against the rebels, saving the villagers from being slaughtered. He returns to the palace, and he reports that there are zero casualties, but the king notices that there's something wrong with him. As he walks around the palace, he stumbles upon Ahmet, and he tells her that there is something he wants to tell her, causing her to get flustered. He takes her to a terrace, where he returns the amulet, saying it protected them, but he feels unworthy of it, so he wants her to give it to someone else. Sari learns about this, and she wonders why Jorman returned it. Lanto thinks it's because Jorman no longer needs it, and Ahmet thinks he's right, but Sari can't accept this, so she makes her way to Jorman. She asks him why he returned it, but Jorman tells her that he can't answer the question. At that moment, Lanto appears, introducing himself as the captain of the Queen's Guard and challenging him to a duel. Lanto wants Jorman to answer Sari's question if he wins, saying he's doing it out of loyalty. The king tells Jorman to accept the challenge, because he wants to see Lanto fight, so Jorman accepts it. As the fight begins, Sari asks the king why he wants them to fight, and the king reveals that he wants to confirm something. Lanto lunges at Jorman, who blocks his attack, kicking him away, and Jormund wins the match. But the king realizes that something's wrong, telling Sari that Jormund is injured. Amit learns about this, so she approaches Jormund, looking at his wound, and giving him an item that will help him recover. Amit thinks this must be the reason why he returned the amulet, so she starts crying, thinking her amulet failed him. Jormund confirms this, saying he didn't want to make her sad, and Amit realizes that Jorman was thinking about her when he returned the amulet, so she tells him that the amulet was the most she could do for him. She knows that he's always risking his life in battle, so she wants him to keep the amulet. Meanwhile, we see Ilya walking through the woods, where he sees mounted beasts holding onto a child. He cuts one of them, causing the child to fall to the ground, as the beasts escape. Ilya checks up on the child. But when he finds that the child is a beast, he points his sword at it, as the child thanks Ilya for saving him. The child introduces himself as Malo, and Ilya sheathes his sword, saying killing a child is a waste of time. He tells Malo to go home, but he doesn't know the way, so Ilya leads him to the border. As they walk, Malo suddenly disappears, and Ilya thinks he got kidnapped again, but he realizes that Malo is just playing around, wanting to play with the flowers. Ilya asks him why the beasts kidnapped him, so Malo tells him about the kids getting kidnapped and sold to humans, who treat them as playthings. Ilya realizes that the beasts he encountered work for humans, and he remembers his first encounter with beasts, making him want to throw up. Malo notices this, so he approaches Ilya, asking him if he's hurt, but he pushes Malo away. Malo reaches out his hand, saying he's trying to rub Ilya without touching him, because his mother does that for him when he gets hurt. An arrow almost hits Malo, as two humans appear, saying the beasts did a terrible job. They reveal that they are working for a noble, and that Malo is their target. They take Malo, as they recognize Ilya as the beast hunter, wondering if he's also after Malo. Ilya says he doesn't care what happens to the child, but he hears Malo screaming for help, and he remembers when his sister was eaten by a beast. So Ilya suddenly stops them, telling them that he hates people who toy with the lives of others. He pulls out his weapon, and charges at one of them, telling Malo to run, but he notices that Ilya is being targeted by the archer, so he gets in the way, causing the archer to miss, because he needs to take Malo alive. Ilya breaks their weapons, telling them to leave if they value their lives, and the men run away. Ilya thinks that Malo will kill humans once he grows up, 
but he remembers how Asari told him that not all beasts are evil, so he starts to believe that beasts are just like humans. Ilya thanks Malo for watching his back, and they reach the border, where he leaves Malo, bidding him farewell. We see Sari and the king on a ship, as the king reveals that the anti-monarchist groups are no longer active. This was discussed during their recent meeting, and the officials thought this was great news, but Anubis thinks the groups are working together. The king tells Sari to rest easy, because she has no particular duties for their next task. Sari wonders what she should do during her free time, wanting to be a good queen, and the king advises her to follow her heart. At the royal palace, Anubis receives an urgent report that their territory is under attack, so he orders a servant to inform the king with a messenger beast. The king receives the message, and he decides to return to Osmargo, but Sari knows that their current task is also important, so she offers to fill in for him. The king refuses to let her go alone, but Sari tells him that she is just following her heart, saying she wants to help him. The king reluctantly gives her permission, but he tells her not to endanger herself. He places a charm on Sari's ring, and he flies back to Osmargo. A naval patrol encounters an illegal vessel, so they order it to stop, but as they approach it, a beast named Fenrir falls from the sky, killing the patrolman. The beast in the illegal vessel, Nir, joins him in the ship, and we learn that Fenrir was expecting Nir to join him. They ride a flying beast together, as Fenrir thinks about storming the royal palace, wanting to kill the king. They see the royal ship, so they attack it, killing the people aboard. One of the soldiers asks who he is, and Fenrir says he's the new king of the beasts. He reveals that his minions are currently invading Osmargo's territories, saying he will take the throne after he kills the king. The soldiers charge at them, but Nir instantly kills them with flying swords. Fenrir inquires about the highest ranking individual on the ship, but the soldiers remain silent, so he thinks about executing all of them. However, Sari suddenly approaches him, grabbing his attention. In the royal palace, the king learns that two of their territories are under attack, so the king thinks about dividing his forces to deal with them, but Anubis suggests keeping the main force in the capital in case of a sneak attack, as he volunteers to lead a cavalry company to deal with the rebels. Back on the ship, Sari introduces herself as the acting queen of Osmargo, telling Fenrir to take her and spare everyone else. Fenrir thinks she's worthless because she's human, but Sari tells him that the king loves her, saying her appearance doesn't matter. Fenrir thinks she's lying, but Nir tells him that Sari had guards protecting her and Magia, so Fenrir decides to take Sari as his sacrifice. Lanto suddenly stops them, as he lunges at them, dodging Nir's flying sword. However, it turns around, and Lanto learns that Nir can use magic to control his swords. Lanto ends up getting stabbed, and Nir is about to finish him off, but Sari stops him, reminding them that she will only go with them if they don't hurt others. Fenrir orders Nir to spare Lanto, who wants to die for Sari, but she orders him to return to the palace and obey the king. She orders Benyu to heal the others, and she tells her watchers to deliver a message to the king, before she leaves with Fenrir. The civilians learn about the invasion, so they gather at the palace gates in a state of panic. Klops rides a messenger beast to return to the palace, and he informs them about the situation. The king wants to save Sari, but Anubis stops him, telling him that he needs to stay in the palace, as he suggests sending a search party. But the king knows that Fenrir has a grudge against him, so he doesn't know what Fenrir will do to Sari. Anubis tells the king to kill him if he insists on going, because his actions are dangerous for the kingdom, and he doesn't want to serve another king. The king calms down and returns to his throne. Klops delivers Sari's message, telling the king not to rescue her, and the king realizes that Sari wants him to defend the people. The king addresses the civilians, confirming that an invasion is taking place, but he tells them not to panic, as he claims he will protect them. He thinks about Fenrir, planning to track him down before he enters the palace, and he is prepared to fight to the death in order to win Sari back and protect his kingdom. The king receives a report, and he learns that the invaders are actually the anti-monarchists that have grouped up, and they are revealed to serve Fenrir. Meanwhile, we see Lanto as he follows after Benyu to look for Sari, but Benyu notes that he can no longer sense her, so she must be in a place with a barrier around it. We see Sari at Fenrir's base, and she asks him why he wants to be king. Fenrir reveals he was the prince of one of Osmargo's vassal states. He was considered a failure compared to his brothers, but he gets a chance to fight against the prince and prove his worth. 
He prepares to attack with blue flames, but the prince easily overpowers him in an instant. The prince claims he doesn't like fighting, saying they should be friends, but Fenrir thinks he's being mocked. He gets one of his ears cut off and gets stripped of his title and gets cast away. Sari thinks he must have a grudge against the king, but Fenrir says it was a fair fight, but he wants a rematch so he can regain his pride, and he plans to return beasts to their natural order, with a strong stand at the top, so he even wants to tear down the border and take over the humans. Sari thinks that if he can only feel strong by hurting others, it's because he is weak, and she says he has no chance against the king. Fenrir gets pissed off, unleashing his flames. Sari is protected by her ring, but she ends up passing out, and Fenrir becomes even more interested, seeing she has the king's protection. We see Anubis as he arrives in the city of Koden to deal with some of the invaders, but he suddenly comes across Nier. Nier recognizes his value and tries to convince him to change sides, saying they share the same ancestors, so he should serve a wolf king instead of a beast, but Anubis refuses, saying he chose the king that he serves, so Nier ends up stabbing him instead. Meanwhile, Fenrir offers Sari all kinds of food, and even jewelry to try to win her over, but she turns it all down. Fenrir wonders what the king is giving her, and she says it's his heart. Fenrir wishes she could be more like Nier, calling him his lovable slave, and we flash back to when Nier was just a pup. He gets whipped for stealing food, but Fenrir ends up taking him in on a whim. Fenrir is happy to have his first servant, giving him his name, and he says they are now together forever. Nier doesn't want to kill for no reason, and he gives Anubis another chance, but Anubis still refuses. Nier is about to finish him off, but Jorman suddenly arrives. He fights off Nier's swords, and Anubis wonders why he's there, because he should be protecting the king, but he says that the king sent him, wanting to protect his friend. Jorman narrowly dodges the blades and he rushes at Nier. The blades are about to stab him from behind, but he manages to slash Nier first. Nier retreats on his flying beast, saying he can't afford to die yet, and Anubis thinks they'll be able to find Fenrir's base if they follow him. We see Lanto has managed to find the base, but as he looks for Sari, Fenrir suddenly appears. Sari tries to get free, but Sai and Binyu manage to find her. Binyu sets her free, and he tells her their plan is to get away while their decoy distracts Fenrir, but Sari demands to go back, not wanting to let Lanto die. Lanto is no match for Fenrir, but he claims he is her guard captain, so he's willing to die for her. Sari suddenly appears, dragging him away, and she refuses to let him die. Sari claims that guards aren't there to die for their masters, and she wants him to be there when she becomes a true queen. Binyu makes it through the barrier, and Lanto catches them as they fall, but he ends up collapsing from the impact. Sai sends a message to Klops, and he tells the king that Fenrir's base has been located. Sari carries Lanto away, but Fenrir catches up to them. He wonders what she can do, telling her to submit to him, but Lanto suddenly stabs his leg, as he jumps away with Sari. Fenrir gets pissed off, jumping after them, but they are saved by Gwibber, and the king makes his appearance. Fenrir gets excited to have his rematch, and the king prepares to take him on. Anubis and Jormund are rushing there as well, but Nir gets in their way, telling them not to interrupt the fight, saying he will stop them by any means necessary, and Jormund knows there's nothing they could do anyway. The king unleashes his power, clashing against Fenrir, but it ends with both parties taking some damage. Fenrir wonders if that's all he's got, as he goes further beyond, unleashing a huge blast that levels the area. The king is brought to his knees, and Fenrir knows he isn't at full strength because he put his power into Sari's ring. Fenrir charges up the rest of his power, unleashing another explosion, but the king is unarmed. The king wonders what he's doing, and Fenrir says he doesn't want to win because he had an advantage, saying they are now on equal footing, and he prepares to settle things as primal beasts. They start fighting with their claws, tearing each other apart. Fenrir bites the king's head, but the king jumps up and slams him down. The king bites down on his neck, and Jormund thinks it's over, but Fenrir manages to push him away. Fenrir bleeds profusely, but he refuses to give up. The king can see his determination, and he thinks about himself, about how he curses his own existence and is merely clinging to the throne. He doubts his resolve, and Fenrir lands an attack on him. The king falls to the ground as Fenrir celebrates, and the king feels he is out of strength, but Sari suddenly calls out his name, Lanhart, and he is reminded that it means brave-hearted. 
He manages to get back up, letting out a ferocious roar, and Fenrir wonders how he can still stand, but he realizes it's because of Sari. Nir can sense Fenrir is afraid, and he thinks back to when Fenrir had his ear cut off. Nir brings him some water, but Fenrir smashes it, saying he's now just a stray dog. Nir prepares to cut his own ear off, but Fenrir stops him, wondering what he's doing. Nir says he wanted to give him his own ear, begging Fenrir to let him stay by his side, because he was the one who gave him a place to belong. Fenrir declares that one day, he will reclaim his pride and become king. Nir reminds him of his pride, and he clashes with the king once more. They both refuse to lose, but in the end, the king is victorious. Sari jumps into the king's arms, and he tells her it's all over, but she tells him not to ever worry her like that again. But that's where this video ends. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.